Hi, this video is about how a generation one um, ZP glucose sensor works and is also um, applicable to generally applicable to um, generation one glucose sensors. So the first thing we'll do is um, just kind of give a bit of a background. So at um, Zimmer and Peacock um, on our on our main website, um, there's a page that covers ZP glucose sensors and sm and um, sense it smart, and it's probably worth knowing that um, we do a pack of 10 glucose sensors and two calibration solutions. And these work really nicely with this um, Sense It Smart from Palm Sensor. It's a really nice um, potential stat. Um, it's powered by the Android phone. So this is a normal Android phone here. Um, the potential stat takes its power from the USB port and then the glucose sensor um, or other, any other sort of sensor can go in there. And that's just basically a normal potential stat. Now, this um, video is really intended to kind of give a bit of a technical um, background on you know, how this sensor is actually functioning um, and is intended to support that product when people, for example, purchase it. So first of all, let's just briefly talk about the construction. So when you get one of these um, glucose sensors, for example, um, this length is about seven millimeters by 25 millimeters. So it's a fairly small piece. and um, so you, you can't really um, see it. Um, it's actually been functionalized on the um, working electrode. You'll see that here. So we have an electrode and we functionalized it with um, a glucose specific enzyme. And we've also put a barrier layer on top to um, protect it. So that gives you a sense of the construction. Now this enzyme is immobilized. So that means that these sensors um, strictly speaking, um, what's called CGM, continuous glucose monitors. So they can be reused or continuously used. Now, we do get a question, which is how often can I reuse them? And how long can I use them for? And the answer is, what are you intending to use them for? Because depending on the application, then they're gonna be, you know, have a good lifetime or, or not such a good lifetime. So that really is dependent on the application itself. And anyway, let's go on now and talk about the, um, bio um, electrochemistry of these kind of glucose sensors. So if we zoom in on one of these glucose sensors, I said that there was a um, immobilized enzyme layer. And now the first part of this now is we're talking about the biochemistry of this immobilized um, enzyme layer. So we have glucose, which in the presence of glucose oxidase and the presence of oxygen, they react together to give us um, gluconolactone. Now the reason I've actually shown then that actually that immediately that glucose goes to um, gluconolactone, which immediately hydrolyzes to gluconic acid. I've shown that because sometimes in papers, they show gluconic acid as a product. And sometimes they say lactone as a product. And sometimes they say gluconolactone as a product. What's happening is the gluconolactone is the initial product and that hydrolyzes to give gluconic acid. The quick, um, you could sort of summarize it and say, it doesn't matter, um, but just for just for um, completeness, I wanted to mention why there's sometimes this discrepancy in papers or in technical literature. But the take home message here is really that glucose in the presence of glucose oxidase reacts with oxygen and the um, and the output of that is hydrogen peroxide. Now, that's the significant molecule here. When we're talking about generation one glucose sensors, hydrogen peroxide is the significant um, molecule. Now. In the presence of the electrode, so you have the glucose kind of coming in, it reacts with the enzyme and with the cofactor oxygen, and we get hydrogen peroxide. If that electrode then is held at a voltage of something like 650 millivolts versus the reference, so the potential stat, or specifically maybe in this case, the um, sensit potential stat um, is applying 650 millivolts, then you will oxidize hydrogen peroxide back to oxygen and um, you will basically get a flow of electrons and what that means is whenever you get electrons and a flow of electrons then you basically have a current and the current is proportional to glucose and so the glucose is directly proportional to the current so that's how a glucose sensor works now that's fairly straightforward. In the end, you have an electrode system that's pretty dumb, 
We've immobilized an enzyme on top of it. The enzyme reacts with glucose. You get hydrogen peroxide, and that would be the end of the interesting story, except um, on the potential stat, we've set a voltage. And because of that voltage, the hydrogen peroxide is oxidized. The electrons flow, and we measure the current. And the current is proportional to the original glucose concentration. And that is the real, the principle of an amperometric glucose sensor. Now, this, it gets a little complicated now because the shape of the signal Often in analytical sciences, we don't really consider the mass transport of molecules. When you're doing UV spectroscopy or absorption spectroscopy, the rate at which molecules are moving around is not really part of the signal. But in electrochemistry, we have an electrode. And the way molecules reach that surface or the rate at which they reach that surface governs how the signal will look. So let me... Um, we have a couple of videos on YouTube, and I will try to sort of link those to this video to this video as well, so you can find those those. But what I'll do is I will, um, I'll pull on. Um, no, what I'll do first of all is I will um, go to the next slide and say the shapes of the signal. So when you watch those two videos, in one of the videos, um, our scientist does an experiment where he measures current with time, and he explains to you that um, in the first instance he has zero. Um, millimole of glucose and then he um, spikes the experiment and the current kind of comes up and then actually if he carried on the current will come down now when the signal looks like this that's a diffusion controlled no stirring what's happening here is then so if i just go if i just wind back a bit in the first instance the overall signal looked like this but in the first instance he, when he's turned it on the signal was in zero millimolar. Now at this point, then it spikes it with some glucose and it comes up. If he left it, the signal will come down again. Because what's happening is the glucose is basically being depleted and you have what's called diffusion limitation. The molecules can't arrive quick enough to keep up with the way the enzyme is producing hydrogen peroxide. And so the signal decreases because you're building up what's called a diffusion barrier. Now in some ways, all it, what you really need to just know is if your signal looks a bit strange like this and it's falling with time, then you're probably in a diffusion control situation. And I've put hyphen here, no stirring, there's no mass transport control. Now we have another video, which I'm also going to link to, where in fact, current falls with time. So in the first instance, this is kind of the wake up period. And then our scientist adds in some glucose and this time it plateaus. And then he adds in some more glucose and it plateaus a bit more. And then he adds in some more glucose and it plateaus a bit more. And um, that is because in that experiment, we are definitely mixing. We've got a little mixer, a little stirrer bar. And so we are um, forcing the mass transport. So rather than diffusion being the process by which molecules are reaching the electrode, we are stirring fast. And that is bringing molecules to the surface of the um, electrode. And so now we have a what we call it, we call it a staircase response, um, but it's sort of easier to interpret than this response where you could get a glucose. So in the first instance, you have a signal, but it's falling with time. Now the magnitude of that signal or, and the area under the curve is proportional to glucose, but it's falling with time. And it's, it can be a little complicated unless you know the reason for that. And the reason for it is you've got this depletion of glucose. Whereas when you're stirring, you don't get this depletion of glucose and you get this nice um, staircase response. So let me just go to the, um, I'll just summarize. So this um, video and this presentation is to help support um, the, um, the pack of um, glucose sensors from Zimmer Peacock. And in that pack, there's these two um, control solutions so you can test the electrodes. And so it's just so you know, sort of the biochemistry that's going on here is that there's basically glucose. The enzyme allows specificity. It produces hydrogen peroxide. And then when you apply 650 millivolts, you're going to get this, these electrons. And the electrons, when they're flowing, is basically current. And the current is proportional to glucose. And that's the sort of bioelectrochemistry of how it's working. If you do it in an unstirred system, you will have signals that fall with time and then we spike it here but if you do it in a stirred system you will actually get plateaus because we are 
forcing fresh glucose all the time to the surface of the electrode. But if you're not doing that, then you're in the first instance of diffusion control. And you might get a jump with the glucose, but then it will fall with time as the diffusion builds up. And the magnitude of the currents in the diffusion control system are proportional to glucose and the area under the curve is proportional to glucose. But it's sometimes easier to start in a stirred system because you can clearly see um, these nice steps as you spike in um, more and more glucose. Okay, thanks very much.